We're continuing our series on the end times, and today we come to the topic of the eternal state of the wicked. And so our scripture reading is Matthew 25, verses 29 to 46 to begin with. Let's give our attention to the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and inspired word. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations and He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will place the sheep on His right, but the goats on the left. Then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed by My Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave Me food. I was thirsty, and you gave Me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed Me. I was naked, and you clothed Me. I was sick, and you visited Me. I was in prison, and you came to Me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and gave you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And then turn to chapter 27 of Matthew's Gospel, and I'd like to read Matthew 27, verses 45 to 50. Matthew 27, verses 45 to 50. Now from the sixth hour... There was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. As far as the reading of God's holy word, may he bless it to us this afternoon. I'd like to, for our confessional reading from our catechism today, read uh, Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer 44. Heidelberg Catechism. Question answer 44, that's page 879 in your songbook, page 879 in your songbook. So let's confess together. Uh, question answer 44 of the Hodberg Catechism. I'll read the question and let's respond all together with the answer. Why does the creed add, he descended into hell? to assure me during attacks of deepest dread and temptation that Christ my Lord, by suffering unspeakable anguish, pain, and terror of soul on the cross, but also earlier, has delivered me from hellish anguish and torment." Brothers and sisters in Christ, we come this afternoon to the most sobering 
of topics in our series on basic eschatology, that is the study of last things. We come to the topic of the eternal state, and in particular, what's the eternal state of the wicked. And as sobering as it was to reflect on death in this series and the final judgment, this is the most sobering of all. But it needs to be addressed because the Bible speaks about it and warns us about it. In fact, as uh, one theologian puts it, Cornelius Venema, in his book on the last things, the doctrine of hell is a true test of our willingness to stay within the boundaries of Scripture when it comes to the subject of the last things. At no point in our consideration of the Bible's teaching about the future are we more inclined to allow our own opinions to take precedence over the Bible's teaching and the church's historic understanding. What we do with the subject of hell is a litmus test of our readiness to follow the way set out in the Scriptures, even when that way proves difficult. And so we're tested this afternoon. Are we committed to the Bible as the Word of God? Uh, Are we committed uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ and what He taught us? Are we true disciples of Jesus? Because Jesus spoke on hell more than anyone in the Bible. And not only did He mention it frequently, but He described it with vivid metaphors. Now that doesn't mean that we don't struggle with it. It's something that even the most pious and best theologians have struggled with. R.C. Sproul was once asked which doctrine he struggles with the most, and he replied, hell. C.S. Lewis was honest about his struggle with hell when he wrote, there is no doctrine which I would more willingly remove from Christianity than this, if it lay in my power. But Lewis knew he can't just change what the Bible says, and that reality isn't determined by how we feel about something. The doctrine of hell, he acknowledged, has the full support of Scripture and especially of our Lord's own words. It has always been held by Christendom and it has the support of reason. And so for these reasons, we cannot just dismiss this topic. We must submit to what God's Word teaches on this most sobering of all topics in the Bible, the topic of hell. In our next sermon, we will listen to a sermon on heaven. But today we need to consider uh, this topic, hell. We'll see first the Bible's teaching on hell, then secondly the justice of hell, and then third, the Christian response to hell. First, the Bible's teaching on hell. Uh, the topic of hell is not a fringe topic. That is, that is, it's not something that's scarcely mentioned in the Bible. In the Bible, there are about 245 road signs warning us about it. That's a lot of road signs. We won't look at all 245 of those today. We'll only consider a few, but before we do, it's important to mention that while the Bible speaks of hell with such vivid metaphors, the metaphors aren't to be taken in a literalistic way. How does the Bible describe it? Well, the Bible describes hell as a place of outer darkness, a lake of fire, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, a place of eternal separation from the blessings of God, a prison, a place of torment where the worm doesn't turn or die. And these are some vivid metaphors. But we must be careful not to interpret the biblical metaphors on hell in a hyper-literal way. And Reformed theologians of the past and present have helpfully articulated this point. Louis Burkhoff in his Systematic Theology writes, it is undoubtedly true that a great deal of the language concerning heaven and hell must be understood figuratively. Now, that doesn't mean that we are softening God's Word or making it more palatable than it is. Rather, as Charles Hodge put it in his systematic theology, these descriptions of the judgment are designed to teach us moral truths and not the physical phenomena by which God's judgment will be accomplished. So, for example, the temperature of hell and its precise location are questions about which we, he says, we need give ourselves no concern. And modern Reformed, theologians, modern Reformed theologians would concur. Cornel Venema writes, Biblical imagery conveys something of the reality of hell, but ought not to be taken literally. We should think soberly and carefully about the reality to which this imagery points us. 
The reality is this, of being banished from the blessed presence of God, being under the felt impression of His everlasting displeasure and being subjected to the perpetual frustration and fury of sinful but futile rebellion against His will. Again, Burkhoff says it is impossible to determine precisely what will constitute the eternal punishment of the wicked, and it behooves us to speak very cautiously on the subject. And when it comes down to it, as dreadful as the metaphors are, the reality will be far more dreadful. Just as we can't imagine how amazing heaven will be, on the flip side, we can't even imagine how terrible hell will be. But we should say no more than what the Scriptures say. What then does the Bible teach about hell? What can be summarized as follows. Hell is a place of God's consummate presence in eternal negative judgment on the unsaved. I'll say that again. Hell is a place of God's consummate presence in eternal negative judgment on the unsaved. And I'm going to just break that definition down a little bit here. First, hell is a place. The Bible describes hell as the dwelling place of the wicked and the devil and the demons. It's a place of eternal torment, an eternal lake of fire, a place of chains and eternal darkness. These are the metaphors of the Bible. While hell is in one sense a state or condition uh, that we already experience in part through the miseries of this life, it's also a place. And the Bible speaks about it as a place. According to Jesus, it's a place you can enter, even be thrown into. Matthew 5, Jesus warns us, If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. In the parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16, the rich man in hell calls it a place of torment. And we see that hell has boundaries, a great chasm such that you can't cross from hell to heaven. And so just as we believe to our great comfort that heaven is really a place, right? Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us, so too should we honestly affirm with trembling that hell is a real place. Second, hell is not just a place, it's a place of God's consummate presence in negative judgment. It's a place of God's consummate presence in negative judgment. Perhaps you've heard that hell is a place of eternal separation from God. This is not really true. It's sort of a half-truth. The fact is that God is omnipresent. In other words, He is everywhere present Even in hell, as Psalm 139 puts it, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? The answer is nowhere. Even if you go to hell, God is still present there. Hell is so terrifying precisely because God is present there. The question is not whether God is present or not. The question is how is He present in hell? And the answer is that he's present in consummate negative judgment. In other words, hell is eternal separation from God's presence in blessing. There will be no sense of God's blessing in hell whatsoever. There will be no sense of his common grace, temporal blessings that even the wicked get to enjoy in this life. Right? The wicked enjoy countless common grace temporal blessings. The blessing of food and drink, family and friendships, arts and entertainments, and so much more. But there will be no sense of God's common grace temporal blessings in hell. Rather, hell is a place devoid of any blessed manifestation of God's love Mercy and grace. And it's important we see this. A lot of people in pop culture, because of uh, 
They just suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And, and because, you know, some people have gone overboard in their descriptions of hell beyond the scriptures, you know, today people just think of it as sort of this cartoonish like place. And, uh, or they think of it as a place, well, I don't mind going there. It's a place where you just party or something. And, uh, but that is absolutely not true. It's not a place you want to go when you understand the biblical teaching. It's a place devoid of any blessed manifestations of God's love, mercy, and grace. John Calvin once said, we ought especially to fix our thoughts upon this, how wretched it is to be cut off from all fellowship with God. And not that only, but so to feel His sovereign power against you that you cannot escape being pressed by it. It would be more bearable to go down into any bottomless depths and spasms than to stand for a moment in these terrors. What and how great is this to be eternally and unceasingly besieged by Him? So it's a place of God's consummate presence in negative judgment. Third, hell is a place of God's consummate presence in eternal negative judgment. Hell is never ending for the wicked. And this is perhaps the most difficult truth about hell for us to believe. And so some have rejected the Bible's teaching and embraced either some form of universalism or some form of annihilationism. That is that God won't punish people eternally in hell, that he'll just get rid of them. They'll just be, won't exist anymore. He'll annihilate them. But as difficult as it may be for us to comprehend and believe, it's what the Bible clearly teaches. It's eternal. Daniel 12, verse 2 says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. When Jesus speaks of the final judgment and the separation of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25, He says, that the goats will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. In both the Old Testament and New Testament, the same words in the Hebrew and the Old Testament, in the Greek and the New Testament, the same words are used to describe the eternal nature of the punishment of the wicked and the eternal nature of the life of the righteous in heaven. So you can't pick and choose there. You You can't say one is eternal and the other is not. Both states are eternal. In Mark 9, Jesus refers to hell as a place of unquenchable fire, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 9 says they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. Now this is a passage that's often been used by annihilationalists. They think it means that when you're destroyed, you just disappear But destruction here does not mean being annihilated. It refers to being wrecked or rendered inoperative. You know, if I told you I destroyed my car in an accident, that doesn't mean it ceased to exist. It means that the car was totaled. That's the idea here. Revelation 20, verse 10, it says, The devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So the Bible clearly teaches the eternal nature of both heaven and hell. And in addition to the clear teaching of the Bible as the grounds um, for rejecting annihilationism, We should also reject it because it doesn't satisfy justice. As one theologian put it, annihilation following immediately on death would be good news for mass murderers as they would not need to come face to face with God to account for their crimes. And so it doesn't satisfy justice. If we believe in annihilationism, there's really nothing for anyone to lose. You might as well just live however you want in this world. It also strips evangelism of a sense of urgency. But annihilationism isn't what the Bible teaches, which is why the prophets, and especially Jesus, warned against hell. Because hell is a place of eternal conscious torment under God's just holy and almighty wrath, not merely a state of non-being. Well, fourth, hell is a place of God's consummate presence and eternal negative judgment on the unsaved. Now is the day of salvation. 
Now's the day to repent and believe and be saved. But those who reject Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior in this life will face God's eternal wrath in hell when Christ returns to judge them. Those who refuse to bow the knee to Jesus and pay homage to the Son of God and instead worship the devil and his demons will, according to Revelation 14, drink the wine of God's wrath poured full strength into the cup of his anger and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever and they have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image. Now you may be wondering, uh, what about those who never had a chance to hear the gospel? Or what about infants who die in infancy who cannot consciously reject Christ or put their faith in Christ? Well, we could of course say a lot about this question, these questions, but we don't have time. But uh, if you want to know how I address these a little bit in a different sermon, go back and listen to my sermon on the children of believers who die in infancy from our Canons of Dort series. And you'll hear the biblical grounds for why the parents of such children ought not to doubt the election and salvation of their children whom God calls out of this life in infancy. And that's based on the gracious covenant promises of God to believers and their children. As for the children of unbelievers and those who never hear the gospel, the Bible clearly teaches that They have original sin in Adam, and at some point of maturity, they have actual sins of their own. We also see from Romans 1 and 2 that those of maturity are without excuse because God has made His existence plain to them in creation and in the works of the law written on their hearts, but they suppress the truth about God and unrighteousness. But as Michael Horton puts it, whatever God might choose to do in any given case He has promised to save all those and only those who call on the name of His Son. Promised. Still, He says, it is precisely because God is sovereign and free in His grace that He can have mercy on whomever He chooses. And so we remain silent on those things. And we remember that God is merciful and sovereign and free. And... uh, Remember that God is just as well. Shall not the just judge of all the earth do what is right on the day of judgment? I'd also add that it seems that there will be more saved people in heaven than unsaved people in hell. Again, we don't have time to talk about this much either, but just remember that there will be, when we read the Bible, we see, especially in Revelation, that there will be an innumerable people in heaven from every tongue and tribe and language and nation who will praise Christ as the Savior of the world. So this is the Bible's clear teaching on hell. Hell is a place of God's consummate presence in eternal negative judgment on the unsaved. But next, let's consider the, the justice of hell. It's important to talk about the justice of hell because we struggle with the justice of hell in a number of ways. We, we struggle because we have false preconceived ideas of hell that aren't based on the Bible, but rather are based on fiction or our imagination. And some have gone beyond what the Scriptures teach in their preaching and teaching on hell. So again, we have to be careful not to say more than the Scriptures on, on any topic, but especially on such an important and sobering topic. As one theologian put it, uh, Paul Helm says, hell is not a torture chamber nor an inquisition for everyone who believes differently than us, but a place of justice. And it's a place of justice for several reasons. First, it's just for God to punish sinners with eternal punishment because sin is an offense against an infinite God who is perfectly holy and just and good and therefore deserves an infinite punishment for all of eternity. Second, hell is a place of justice because those who are sentenced to hell hated God and His Christ in this life, and they will forever hate God and His Christ in the life to come. Romans 1-2 explains that God in His wrath against those who reject Him gives them up to the sinful passions of their hearts. This doesn't mean that God makes anybody sin. It means that He leaves them to themselves more and more. 
It means that the worst, the worst and fairest punishment God can give a person is to allow them their sinful heart's deepest desire, the desire for independence. The wicked choose a life apart from God. They not only wander away from God like sheep going their own way, they willingly run from God. And the only thing that will save anyone, indeed the only thing that saved you and me, if you believe, is if God has mercy on them and gives them a new heart for Him, He must grant them the new birth by the Spirit. What is hell then? As Tim Keller puts it, it is God actively giving us up to what we have freely chosen to go our own way, be our own the master of our fate, the captain of our souls, to get away from Him and His control. It is God banishing us to regions we have desperately tried to get into all our lives. We run from the presence of God, and therefore God actively gives us up to our desire. Hell is therefore a prison in which the doors are first locked from the inside by us, and therefore are locked from the outside by God. No one goes to hell who does not choose both to go and stay there. What could be more fair than that? But it will still be terrible. And thanks be to God that He sovereignly and graciously turned our hearts to desire Him and to believe in Christ as our Lord and Savior. Third, hell is a place of justice because it's a place of proportionate justice and gradations of punishment. In other words, everyone gets what they justly deserve. So for example, those who had a greater deal of God's revelation will suffer more severe judgment than those who didn't have the same degree of revelation. This is why Jesus says to those who rejected Him, Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town, that town that rejected me. It will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? Because it's one thing to reject God's prophets in the Old Testament. It's another to reject God in the flesh, in the person and work of Christ, the prophet of prophets. So much more has been revealed this side of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So those who neglect and reject so great a salvation in our day and age will be more severely punished than those alive before the first coming of Christ. Also, those born in Christian families who have been faithfully taught God's Word by their parents, sat under the preaching of God's Word, were baptized, and had every opportunity to hear and believe the gospel will be judged more severely than children born to unbelieving family member families if they reject Christ. So pray for the salvation of covenant children who are wandering from the faith. Also, there will be gradations of punishment, as I mentioned. Hermann Boving puts it this way, the penalty of damnation is the same, but the penalty of sensation differs. The Bible gives us no grounds to believe that a respectable unbeliever who lived a fairly decent life, humanly speaking, by God's common grace, will be punished just as severely as Hitler or the terrorists who crashed the airplanes in the Twin Towers in New York City on 9-11. And so hell is a place of justice because no one suffers there except those who deserve to suffer and no one suffers more nor less than they deserve. As Michael Horton puts it, a measure of our own ongoing sinfulness is that we just don't understand the beauty of God's holiness, righteousness, and justice and the equal ultimacy of these attributes with His love. But one day we will not have a problem with eternal punishment, it will make perfect sense. And so we trust God's word now, even when it may be difficult. But on that day, we will praise God perfectly for his justice. And in no way will the concept of hell diminish our joy in heaven, in the consummate blessed presence of our triune God. 
But how should we respond now as Christians to the biblical teaching on hell? Well, first, warn. Warn unbelievers about it. But do so with humility, solemnity, and great compassion. We should never talk about hell in a way that is trivial and trite. We should never relish thoughts of the wicked there. We should never have the attitude, well, at least it's not me. We should repent of such sinful attitudes. If God, it says in the Bible, does not delight in the death of the wicked, if Jesus wept over Jerusalem, if Paul had great sorrow and unceasing anguish in his heart for unbelieving Jews, then should we not also have a great heart of compassion for those who are lost and warn them in tenderness with tears? about hell, and tell them about Jesus. We who are saved by mercy and grace alone should never speak of hell in a proud and harsh way. Rather, we should speak about it with humility, solemnity, and compassion for the unsaved in this life, praying earnestly for their salvation. And so let this truth about hell spur you on to continue to pray for the lost, to share the gospel with others, and to support the work of evangelism and missions. Second, hell urges us to see the seriousness of our sin and to fight against it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Our sin is so wicked that it deserves hell, and Christ had to suffer hell to redeem us. As we sing in the hymn, Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted, ye who think of sin but lightly, nor suppose the evil great, here on the cross may view its nature rightly, here its guilt may estimate, mark the sacrifice appointed, see who bears the awful load, tis tis the word, the Lord's anointed, Son of man and Son of God. And sin always brings misery. When cultivated, it sort of grows into a hell of its own. And we who have lived long enough know the kind of misery that our sins can bring about. And sin disrupts the joy of our fellowship with God. And so let us fight against sin all the more in the power of the Holy Spirit because of these things. Let us not rationalize our sin. Let us hate it as God hates it and turn from it more and more by God's grace. Third, hell deepens our love for Christ because it reveals just how much Jesus loved us and how much he did for us while we were yet sinners, his enemies. This is why we sing so passionately about the cross of Jesus Christ. We sing love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. If you repent of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, then you need never fear that you will one day wake up in hell. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you never have to fear that one day you will wake up in hell. Why? Because Jesus suffered hell for you on the cross. Everything that we have said in this sermon that strikes terror into your heart, and rightly so, know that all of that was placed on Jesus on the cross in your place. He deserved heaven because of His perfect obedience. But He suffered hell as your sinless substitute. And no doubt He experienced excruciating pain on the cross, but the bodily pain that He experienced was like a flea bite compared to the agony of His soul when he cried out, my God, my God, oh, why have you forsaken me? God's shining face of blessing was withdrawn from him. And God turned his face of wrath against him. And this is why Jesus was sorrowful unto death in the garden of Gethsemane. And his sweat was like drops of blood. This is why he fell on his face and prayed earnestly, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. 
You see, he knew he would drink the cup of God's wrath on the cross and suffer hell. But he willingly pressed on in love and obedience to his Father and in love for you and me, even while we were his enemies. And he drank the cup of God's wrath down to its dregs. And then he cried out, it is finished. Jesus paid off the debt of all your sins and suffered the curse of the law in your place. He was forsaken so that you and I who trust in Christ would never be forsaken by God so that nothing would ever separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And because of the infinite worth of who He is as the eternal Son of God and true and righteous man, He not only satisfied God's justice, He also earned you and me the reward of heaven. Jesus drank the cup of wrath so that you and I could drink the cup of blessing today in the Lord's Supper. And one day in fullness of joy at the wedding supper of the Lamb. And so beloved, let us love Christ more because of this sermon on hell. Let us obey His commands in joy and in gratitude. Let us take up our cross and follow Him, knowing that whatever sufferings and persecutions we go through in this world won't even be worth comparing to the glory that awaits us that will far outweigh it all when we see Christ face to face and are brought into the new heavens and new earth to enjoy God's consummate blessed presence forever and ever. And so let us rest in the finished work of Christ this day and be comforted with the peace that we have this day right now with God forever and ever in Christ. Let us rejoice and be comforted and assured that Christ has delivered us from hell through His life, death, resurrection, and ascension and is coming again to bring us to heaven. As our catechism puts it, why does the creed add He descended into hell? To assure me during attacks of deepest dread and temptations that Christ, my Lord, by suffering unspeakable anguish, pain, and terror of soul on the cross, but also earlier, has delivered me from hellish anguish and torment. And think about it. When you get to heaven, there's only going to be one person there that ever suffered hell truly. And that's our Lord Jesus Christ to redeem you and me. And on the flip side, our catechism asks in question and answer 58, how does the article concerning life everlasting comfort you even as I already now experience in my heart the beginning of eternal joy, so after this life I will have perfect blessedness such as no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart has ever imagined a blessedness in which to praise God eternally. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word to us, even though it's very sobering to reflect upon this topic. We, we trust that it is true, it is real, because You have revealed it to us so clearly and abundantly in Your Word that sinners might be warned and turn from their wickedness, repent, and Turn to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. And we thank you for so great a salvation that you have provided for us in Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son. That you so loved us that you gave him as a sacrifice for us on the cross and that he suffered hell in our place. And we thank you that we who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ never have to fear it that nothing will separate us from your love. Father, help us to never take this for granted. Help us to go into this week knowing that you love us. You'll always be with us. You'll always protect us ultimately. That all of our fears and worries in this life, that we can face them because our, our greatest fear and worry is behind us because we have peace with you. 
Your wrath is no longer upon us. You are our compassionate, loving, faithful Father. And so help us to go into this week as children of the Heavenly Father, dearly loved, resting in your love for us in Christ and and resting in the love of Christ who willingly went through hell to save us. And therefore, surely he who began a good work in us will carry it on to completion when he returns. And so keep us by your spirit. Father, help us also to share the hope within us, help us to share the gospel with others, to have a heart for the lost. Help us to pray for them. We pray that you'd save our unbelieving family members and friends and coworkers and others around us. May the gospel go forth in power today. Save all your elect. And Father, help us to rejoice in the Lord and rest in so great a salvation now as we partake of the Lord's Supper. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.